I guess you're muted. Your mic is on mute. Good morning, everyone. Is, is everyone able to hear me? If you can, please uh, mention in the chat. You can give me a thumbs up. If the audio is clear, the video is clear. If you have any queries, you can mention it in the group chat. I'm checking in there so you can. Uh, Okay, great. Thank you, Varun. Um, so, how's everyone feeling today? Feeling good? Okay, then let's move on. Without further ado, my name is Prashant. You can call me TK. Um, I am from Bangalore, Karnataka, India. I am currently serving as the lead of products for Vigrin Technology. We are a pretty groundbreaking company. We've uh, tackled some of the most critical problems the world is facing today, healthcare, hospitals are facing today. And um, not only are we tackling them, we are actually trying to market them so that as many people in the world can use it, as many businesses, as many hospitals. Um, so I will start going through some of the colorful uh, pictures I'm going to show to you. So you can enjoy, sit back and relax and get ready to have your mind blown. Great. So, human factors, AI, and analytics in healthcare. That's what we're going to be talking about, chatting about, and playing about today. I'm going to introduce to you the topic. Um, feel free to ask any questions anytime. You can mention it in the chat, and um, we will answer it. This Q&A is also important. Uh, you can ask, don't take any questions stupid or anything. Please, feel free to interact. Uh, after we introduce the idea of human factors and artificial intelligence, and the ergonomics for maximum efficiency, we try to understand why it is that we need all this automation and analytics in healthcare. Then uh, we tackle some of the problems in automated systems, robots and AI. And we, I will show you some of the solutions and um, I will go through all of that. And um, soon, and then I will walk you through an implementation of some of our products. Now then is CXM uh, and the other one is Chatbot. And, um, Finally, we just go through the results and the future work, what we want to do in the future, and opportunities for you and everybody as well. And uh, yes, Q and A. So, introduction will break down the topic. Uh, what is a factor? The number two is a factor of six uh, because when you multiply two with the number three, it contributes to a result. So, any factor that contributes to maximum efficiency in a human being when he is working or working on certain activities, playing. You know, that is a, a contributive, a positive human factor. That's what we want to study today. We want to make ourselves smarter. Now, what is AI? When you break it down, you break down a robot down to circuitry and logic, what is it? Basically, it's just developing technology or systems that to perform tasks that usually require human intelligence. A very simple example, which I always love giving, is bomb disposal. You must have played a lot of counter spy games and watched movies and everything. And um, any bomb can be triggered remotely. That's why we send robots into the field, even to Mars as well, to environment, where you can do simple tasks. And uh, so this talk is mainly about um, how we're going to use all these technologies at our disposal to achieve maximum efficiency, to get smarter, or faster, anything, whatever uh, the idea of your idea of efficiency is. Now I'm going to ask you a simple question to all you geniuses sitting in the room. Um, how many of you think we don't need robots? How many of you think we don't need AI? You can give me an emoji with a face on it. Take your emotion and let me know. I'll wait for a minute. Like a survey. So I'm trying to take your feedback. If you think we don't need AI, we don't need robots in the future, we don't want Terminators and all of that, feel free to just type it in in the emoji in the conversation and I'll be and uh, we'll take off just a survey. Nothing to worry about. So the chat should be at the um, in your Microsoft Teams toolbar. So uh, just click on it. You can just let me know. We'll count. We'll have a vote. How many people think AI is bad? The cons.
Great. Tanya found it. Thinks we don't need AI. Smart girl. <laughs> Arun Kumar thinks we need AI. What I need to say is if right now the poll is only for checking, how many people think if we do not need AI or robots? Need the number of people. Okay, take your water, take a small break, and give me an emoji as well. High five. Okay, how many of you think we actually need AI? I can, can I get a thumbs up? We can actually have a poll. Actually. <laughs> Uh, nobody thinks we don't need robots so far. That's how the general consensus looks. Everybody is, seems to be pro AI. Uh, Lokesh Kumar too. Interesting perspective. So um, I guess why this has become so is because there was actually a research study conducted, um, and the paper is cited below. It's on breast cancer. So um, an AI model, an artificial intelligence robot, was used to diagnose breast cancer and it was put against uh, versus a team of 11 pathologists and it actually performed at a higher accuracy than the pathologists themselves. So, not even self-driving cars have to actually prove that robots can um, perform certain critical tasks better and at a higher rate of accuracy. So, yeah, that's why I guess all these thumbs up are coming up. Nimesh, Arun, Mithal, yes sir. Okay, let's move on. You are right, we need AI, but do we really need all this healthcare analytics? Why are we investing billions of dollars and, and big data? And uh, why? So, uh, healthcare data is, you actually work in a hospital environment. If you work in an ICU and you try to work with those computers and uh, databases, you'll see that they follow many standards. MIMIC is Massachusetts. It's an MIT system for ICU data, critical care intensive unit. HL7 is the open standard for uh, storing healthcare records. EHR is electronic healthcare record. If you take an X-ray or an MRI, all those images, um, yes, all those images are coming the DICOM standard. And um, so there are these different standards, not your usual JPEG or PNG, right? So even the data, the Blood test data, the urine test, the COVID test data, and the images are all different formats. So all this data, how are we going to make sense of it? Uh, are we just going to give up? No. So why we? that's why we created the computer in the first place, calculator. We just make all these huge numbers compute faster and, and much more simpler just with a touch of a few fingertips automatically. And um, yes. An example is the India COVID-19 dashboard. So if you go to zoho.com and you go to slash COVID slash India, you will see India's live real-time state of India's uh, status on COVID and uh, how much we're suffering and how much we're recovering. If you actually think about the information collected across all the different clinics and states, some of that information actually being paper, and you're trying to get an overall, somebody asked you the question, how many cases are there in India? Would you really be able to answer it just like that? Think not. That that's why you put all the data together on a single database system and you run all these analytics queries on it and algorithms on it and you get out these actionable metrics. Something you and I, even a child, a doctor or a prime minister can act on. He wants to know how many deaths have happened, how many recovered cases are there. So that's why we invest so much into analytics and dashboards and, and the colorful charts, pie charts that compare um, female versus males and age groups and all of that. Why else do you think we need analytics if you go out and read real cases and stories? Please feel free to type it out and uh, we can all share uh, what we think, your ideas and your opinions uh, in the Microsoft Teams chat room. Right? Okay. So we need analytics and we've created them, but they all have problems. Every robot, every self-driving car, you may not have a problem. Accidents, many of you might have even heard about it, but some customers have lost their life. So, robots, chatbots. Um, if you, I'll 
can be a very simple AI robot. Let's say you have an, a traffic camera. It has a uh, computer vision algorithm running inside. And uh, what it does is it will take image. And if it fits a pattern, it will output it. If it sees a number plate, basically, it will give an output saying number plate. So if you train it for images of a pig or a water bottle, um, it will just uh, output an, a text such as PIG looking at the image data. And image data is uh, 1 KB, 1 MB. Okay. So all I have to do is to trick the system, I will just change a few color pixels, like let's say somewhere on the left or in the bottom right, and just put a little bit of blue, a little bit of red. Overall, it still looks like a pig, but a couple of pixels have changed. Some noise has been added to the system. Less than half a percentage of right? 0 0.005. And uh, when you add this noise to the system, a robot will completely change because it is mathematical. It will look at all the numbers and all the RGB values of all the pixels to make one final decision, right? And the final decision is this factor of noise that I've added, it, it is completely thrown it off. It will take it an airliner. We apply the same principle for the case of detecting a tumor in a cancerous patient or an NLP thing. Instead of when a person wants to get an appointment with a doctor, uh, it can be, it will end up doing something else in action. It might say it's a, not a cancer patient when the tumor is actually there in the picture. So uh, it's important to train uh, and uh, figure out all these adversarial examples are taken care of. And uh, we are still training AI to diagnose patients using natural language, NLP. One of the chatbots I'm going to show you towards the end of the presentation. Um, this AI chatbot we have initially designed to create it for multiple South Indian languages, English, Kannada, Tamil, Malayalam. So people, local people will be able to access it just using a mobile phone. But um, there are 21 languages in India and around 6,500 languages in the world. And all these thousands of languages are there. How are you going to create a solution that can scale? How can you make it uh, work towards uh, the global requirement? That's something we're all going to have to think about. And the third problem is the trolley problem. I'll explain it to you very simple terms. So let's say there is a there is a big carriage of a trolley of a train carriage moving down the track. And somebody is tied down to the track at the end of it. And uh, if you press the button, um, the track is going to switch. So that person is going to be there, but the track which gets switched uh, the train is going to go over five more people who are also tied in the uh, alternative track. So if you press the button, the train is going to run over the five people. If you don't press the button, you don't take any action, the train is going to run over that one person. That is a trolley problem. And uh, how are you going to solve it? Are you going to press the button or are you not going to press the button? How do you weigh the greater good? And most importantly for you all, all you geniuses and all you engineers, and scientists have to figure out how you went to whatever logic, let's say you have an answer, which you probably typed in the chat room. How are you going to program it into a logic? How are you going to make your self-driving car, make sure it misses the electric pole but doesn't kill anybody and still saves your life and the end? Okay, problems, problems, problems. Where is the solution? Okay, so the solution is um, really uh, simple, right? Don't overthink. We think very simple and we've come up with machine learning, AI, and I will explain it to you in very simple terms. Um, how it works and how it will work in the future as well. So imagine you have raw, raw data, right? Uh, raw data meaning there's semicolons, there are commas, zeros for missing fields and all that. It's raw and you don't understand what some of the fields and the code names even mean. There will be underscores and um, and you need something simple as a solution. Your output has to be something that you can act on. It has to say, yes, this person has COVID, isolate him, or no, um, don't do this particular action. You need a simple output and you need all this complicated input. You just feed it to a system, a black box. How do you do it? So this, the, It's a three-step solution. The first step is you do data engineering. Data engineering is actually a pretty cool job in many of the biggest industries in the world today for the tech industry. What do you do? What does a data engineer do? You have access to huge terabytes of data, right? It can be virus DNA sequences. It can be text messages coming from some earthquake or a tsunami, um, or it can be uh, image data of symptoms. You, suddenly you have a huge data of 
tumors or lung pictures, right? Uh, or even map location, uh, meaning if you have a map of India and you see a lot of red dots like the pins from Google Maps in one area, it kind of gives you a general pattern that something critical is happening in that area. Now, how are you going to feed the images of lungs or text messages to a robot that only understands numbers? This is a process which you also call feature vector extraction. Um, a vector. A vector is just a list of numbers. So people who understand coding or all that. It's the same as an array. A list of numbers. So, um, an RGB. Every time you watch TV or your computer screen, every pixel is a representation of RGB. It's got three channels. And um, so, every single image data we are seeing uh, is actually a three-dimensional vector. So three-dimensional meaning it's got three. It's got yeah, red, uh, a value for red, a value for green, and a value for blue. So the zero, zero, and zero. No color means it's black. That's how we represent images to computers so they can understand it. Now let's say we have broken down all your image uh, pixels into a list of RGB vectors. You have. You have this data set of numbers with you now. So you have successfully broken down your images into a set of numbers, ready to be fed into your machine learning algorithm or neural net. Step one, complete. Step two, you have these vectors, you have these um, uh, input data, and you have your answers. Let's say um, you have a, your doctor, right? Your family doctor has uh, provided you a data set of 100 patients and um, uh, 100 input values and 100 uh, output values saying uh, this patient with a hemoglobin value of this much, uh, age of this much, gender this much, uh, A, X, Y, and Z, and the output value is yes, this person is a COVID patient, and no, this person is uh, not, uh, not a patient, something like that. So you have 100 of these cases. So what do you do? You take 80% of them for the tra training your robot, training your machine learning neural network, and you keep 20 of these examples aside for testing to see if the machine can work it out. And um, so, with the 80 input values, what you have, you every time the machine makes a prediction, every time it reads a vector, and um, the neural network um, uh, is able to adjust its wave, or you know, the machine makes a prediction saying it's um, and 85% sure this isn't a COVID patient, but it's actually 100% sure. Uh, the actual answer is it should be 100% yes. So the error is around 0.15, 15%. So what you do is you make you propagate the error back, back to the robot, and it makes uh, your chatbot, and it, you back propagate the lost value. So the machine predicts again, and next time it predicts, it will make a smaller error value. It will make a uh, next prediction of around 90%. Or instead of making 100%, uh, proving it's 100% uh, a COVID patient. So what you do is every time the loss value comes down, it will reach a global minimum. The minimum when the robot reaches a minimum loss value, that means it has learned the basic idea, and then you stop the training process. Uh, how all these values and weights work? This will this basic. So it's, it's neural networks, and there are deep neural networks which I would be happy to teach you in another workshop or webinar, no problem. So the idea is, let's just say it's a black box for now, and you have your machine that's trained on 80 patients, and uh, you have 80 predictions, and it's got a, let's say, it's an accuracy level of 95% accuracy, your robot. And then you test it. How do you get 95% accuracy? You test it on the 20 cases, and you have um, your result. So far, so good. And you have now been able to um, Predict, make a machine predict the values for let's say a thousand patients with an accuracy of 95%. So you can make your robot, even if you have a small data set of 100 people, you can um, deploy it on the cloud to act on 100 patients with 1 lakh people. So that's how you scale up your solution with whatever limited data you have. Uh, the last step of the solution is um, the, the presentation part. So your robot is capable, or your machine learning algorithm is capable of outputting yes and no, or zero and one, for classifying, saying it's a, if this is a lamppost for you, Mr. Fairplane car. Please don't go straight. And it's one, it's a lamppost. Take a left. All these zeros and ones, uh, they are not really tangible. 
I can't, I can't use them. I doubt doctors will be able to use them if you keep saying 0101. Zero, one, zero, one. Um, they need to know uh, uh, what exactly the specifics of the patient is. And um, even in other cases of AI, right, or robots, bomb disposal, or whatever, anything you can think, Mars, robots on the moon. So you need um, to build an analytics or more like a, a user interface, a UI for your robot so it can act. It can work around these values, the output values. So the interaction, this human-computer interaction with real people is not just zero or one, an actual dialogue. So if you have a chatbot, you want the response to actually be feel like an actual um, dialogue with the person, not just, uh, okay, your appointment is confirmed uh, with a tick mark and that's it. You want to um, collect all the information back and forth, make sure the interaction feels like it's a real human being. That's how when you would notice that when most senior citizens, even children would feel um, much more, they feel it, the experience that is more reliable when they're speaking to a robot or, robot or an agent that speaks like a human being and not asking strange questions. Okay, thanks for the thumbs up, Shitej. Uh, it looks like everything's going so good down in the middle of the presentation. And we continue. So some of the examples is, uh, examples are um, when you use COVID input data uh, that is being bombarded to you by all these different hospitals, clinics, and websites. So they will carry comorbidities. Comorbidities meaning somebody has a failed kidney or a heart patient or a, a very critical diabetic condition and um, and uh, age. It's a comorbidity the history of the patient or uh, the person. Age, the number, gender will be male or female, which will be a text value, blood test metrics, um, it will be probably an array, a vector of its own. All this input data has to be output as a one or a zero. So usually in COVID, in the case of COVID, you want to know whether it's a test case is a positive or negative. So you know, if you read the newspapers or heard about the news, when we started testing initially, many cases were actually negative. But uh, it is to come out as positive and uh, this is very troublesome. Another example of image analysis. Um, when you have X-ray scans, MRI scans, or, or DICOM data, or uh, even not even healthcare, in real life, um, if you want to see a suspicious looking object like a bomb or a traffic camera, um, if you have any other examples, you can mention it. Basically, what the image analysis algorithm will output, it will output uh, an object detection, right? So what it's going to output is um, your object detection, meaning what is the object in the image? Is it a license plate uh, or is it a water bottle? Is it a pig or uh, what exactly is it? Is it, is it, you know, if it's a predator, if it's a drone flying in the air and there are terrorists on the ground, is it as a terrorist movement or is it a stream? So that's object detection and classifiers is classifying the type of object. What is your output going to do? Is it a case of high case of um, a tumor or a critical tumor? There are different types of tumors and different types of um, COVID metrics as well. So it's more of a class, meaning what class does this case belong to? Natural language, the language we and you speak. Input data will usually be in the form of text. And um, uh, it can be in multiple languages. So we still figure a way around all this to convert all of this into numbers. There is an algorithm called word to vec and it's also called Jensen. What it will do is, every word in the human English dictionary, um, we have been able to provide a, a vector of the dimension is pretty huge, somewhere in the size of median. Every vector is spatially represented, uh, meaning if the, the word VIT or the word webinar uh, will have a value of 0, 0 0.7, 0 0.7 as a list of numbers. And the word uh, VIT and the word of genius will all have similar vector values, numbers that are close by. It will be 113, 112, and 114, let's say. And a word that is completely unrelated, such as, uh, I would say, I don't know, Corona or, I don't know, MIT, uh, a completely inferior college. <laughs> I'm just joking. But they would have different vector values. They would be having 7, 7, and 9, or Boeing aeroplanes. They would have a value of 10, 10, and 10. It's not really related to the webinar. Not really Boeing 747, it's not really, it's an aeroplane that is not related to um, this topic of healthcare analysis. That's why the vectors are words and sentences are all represented as vectors and we feed them to the machine black box. 
now this machine that you smart students of PIT will create uh, will be outputting a variety of values. It can also output one or zero for sentiment analysis. It can also do fast object detection or named entity recognition or it can do question and answer. So if you go to um, Stanford for NLP the website, they have trained uh, a machine on using a lot of text English data to ask questions to human beings and take their answers. It can also do comprehension. So uh, basically, if you read a paragraph and you ask it a question, it will be able to answer correctly or with some probability of, with a small margin of error. It's capable of human comprehension just like a real human being. So you can train uh, all these machines however you want to for your use case so you're able to understand uh, and make them more humanized, more, more uh, real life. So that's your solution. Three step solution first, you, you do the data engineering, you step two, you feed all your uh, feature vectors and you train your machine or robot on it to make sure the error is minimum, use a global minimum and uh, step three is um, you test your solution on, on real life cases with real life people, you take your feedback, you take your results and you train it again and you refine your brain, your, your AI brain, your, your robotic uh, brain system too. Um, Predict correct answers in the future. Now we understood the solution in theory. How do we practically implement it? Now this is where um, I'm going to uh, walk you slowly, walk you through slowly uh, with all our products. And um, um, right now sitting in the company, my uh, QA battery whale is also here. He's uh, also going to help. Basically, I'm going to show you some of the uh, products that you built an AI chatbot, a natural language chatbot, and also um, CXM, which is a customer experience management tool uh, to manage uh, all the patient problems. So, I'm going to have to get your feedback, dear friend. Are you able to see? Um, are you able to see there's a site called Med Hospital and you're able to see a chatbot at the bottom called EOS. Ah, great. Thank you, Sanya. So, yes, um, this is our chatbot. Um, EOS is basically a feed product sort of that's why we named it the one uh, for a thing. It's a virtual agent. What it does is, let's say you wake up in the morning and you have an immense pain in your kidney. You're not able to bear it. You take up your phone and you go to a little website, the one close to you, and you start pressing some buttons. You want an appointment with the doctor immediately. Do you want to book an appointment for yourself? Yes, you get yourself. And if you're comfortable with the privacy policy of the hospital, you have read it. If you click on agree, and um, you enter the full name of the patient. Okay, and, um, I'm going to enter my full name here. Uh, the robot's going to ask me my name. I, mean, I feel like I'm actually talking to somebody from the hospital now already. So I'm going to mention uh, the age. I will select the gender. Uh, this will also help the doctors and the hospital. Uh, and the diagnosis case uh, of customer whose age is known and the uh, gender will be much easier later on. So, phone number is going to be 10 digits only. Um, first, we can customize that for you once before. And um, yes, so the closest location to me, um, I select the location. I will, um, you can, there are doctors, so how we've done it is, uh, is it still visible, is the screen still visible? Hello? I just want to give it a check. Okay, great. Yeah, so you think departments have different hospitals here, and, um, I just want to get a urology appointment with Dr. Petriwell. Oh, he's available first thing in the morning, 11.45 today. It's 11.31 now. I have around 14 minutes to make it. Yes, sir. I want an appointment with the doctor. I want to confirm it. 27th, 11.45 a.m. Dr. Petriwell, urology department. I just have to when I walk in and provide this screenshot to them and they'll be able to help me out. 
Thank you for submitting your details. The best part about this is that it's really fast and uh, this conversation is over. Within one minute, within 60 seconds, uh, you're completing the dialogue and you, you successfully have an appointment with the nearest doctor to you. Right? And now, uh, all the people who are going to uh, access the chatbots from various websites, hospitals, branches, and organizations, how are you going to manage them as uh, a let's say you're a doctor or a nurse or a clinical decision support uh, agent? And so, we have a tool called EXM. And um, I can just show you here. I so you will be able to see here. customer experience management. How we are going to convert leads to patients or customers and close them. You know, uh, people who come to hospital, they will come. Usually, they will um, pay uh, after their appointment and consultation is over. And um, we have to like record the information. Some of these customers are loyal and uh, they will come from um, the returning customers. So, anyway, leads, uh, you need time series data to measure it across different months. We have some uh, patients from February, that's what this trend line suggests. Uh, there are different stages here. This is a pie chart. Today, uh, we have more leads from CFM that are empty, but I will click on and show you. Um, and you also have uh, lead counts that you can compare across the stages weekly and monthly charts so uh, you know understand how many people are actually missing out care. So when I say stage wise, uh, develop meaning you just meaning you just transform meaning uh, those leads have been given an appointment and um, close is the next stage develop transform and close and the close stage is basically going to um, this means that this patient has paid you and this you will understand it deeper when you visit the leads part. Leads is the people section, your directory, your patient. Similar to an electronic health record, an electronic medical record. Um, each person has a stage and they go through the stages, join, develop, transform, close. Um, and um, you can also WhatsApp them, message them, email them directly from here, from one single system. Just put a click on one button. You can record notes for a particular lead, and um, yes, so if I create a note here, um, I just have to send her a brochure by the end of a particular date, so if I record by the end of next week, if I just uh, note it down, it's going to be recorded here, and uh, all these actions are recorded in a timeline, and the timeline is going to show how this lead is, um, what needs to be done to the lead next, the uh, next action to the lead. The date of the note is also there, and um, let's say you, this is your system, your UI is sitting at the front desk of your local clinic or hospital, and um, you have the picture of the person. So. Um, and uh, they have just provided your details. Now you are sitting at the front desk of a hospital and you do, uh, you assign some of the agents who are available to you. Right now I am logged in as a manager agent. So I just have to mention the agent, what is phone number, uh, so that I can remind them about an appointment. WhatsApp number, email, all that is um, optional. I just provide an email just in case, but I can show it to you. Arun Kumar, I'm guessing your VIP email address. Don't worry, I'm a human agent, not your robot trying to hack you. <laughs> okay, now gender is also just a requirement for a diagnosing a patient or a customer in this case. And um, moving on, you try to locate the lead. Here's the waterfall we have the hospital. We have the address here. So, uh, a new lead has been added to the system. And currently, in the develop stage. So, a um, couple of things to note here. This information, when I log in as an agent, it will uh, be invisible because. Uh, 
something with the Health Rights and Information Act. So I will, will be masking it. Now, if I want an appointment with a doctor, obviously all I have to do is um, particular, let's say, there's a doctor here. Okay. The doctor, if any slots are available, you have to first select a date and then if there are slots available. That's how you create appointments for leads. You can also search leads by their uh, uh, name. You can search them by their email address. You can, uh, it makes it easier. And sometimes in big hospitals, they have PNR numbers, patient registration numbers, and everything's unique for each patient, so it becomes easier to search. And uh, to do is a section where if you're in a hospital, you have created um, all these they call the tasks to be done by a sample agent. Um, I'm going to do is uh, give it a decent name, send the new department to so you want to send it to your clients, agents, families of patients who want to feel they're well taken care of by the system that you have created. Um, and as in, uh, as a manager, I can assign this to any of the agents for the roles that I have created. Oh, yes, um, that's how that part works. So this is CXM. And um, I'll show you one last tool, which is uh, we have leads coming in from CXM and you have them coming in from uh, all the different agents. But how are you going to check if they are visible Let's see if the latest chatbot lead is coming here. Yes, this is the latest chatbot virtual agent lead. And um, he's currently in the transform stage because uh, they have an appointment with the doctor already. You see, when you value people, um, some of them will just come to inquire about uh, hospitals and all that. Some of them actually need an appointment with the doctor. That is why their value is, uh, their value is higher for the system. And uh, the appointment started is pending, and um, that is how we handle it in the system. Uh, all this information is masked, as you can see. There is an act called PIPEDA, if you read about it, PHIPA, Health Privacy Information Insurance Act. And once the patient is done uh, with the payment, you can just close the lead. Congratulations, we are now have now a successful customer. The revolve stage, basically some patients will come again and again uh, at the revolve stage um, for dialysis, for example, and these returning customers, these follow-up customers, we will record them here. And uh, all the notes that we are recording will be monitored and recorded there. And if you want to email some of their family members, or email here. Okay. Um, after that, the last tool, as I was told here, is insights. Now you have all the leads coming in from different. Um, do you have leads? Are you leads? Yes, you see the insights. So insights is uh, the third tool we are creating, and um, what it does is um, the analytics end step three of the solution. Right? Um, we understand all these automated data analytics systems are running in the background, and uh, we need to know. In simple terms, what is the income generated today? What is uh, how many leads are there in this week and this month? Or uh, you want to compare them across their stages, the gender? How many of the leads are coming from the chatbots? For example, if you have two chatbots, and um, you can compare them. So all this information will be helpful not only for you, um, it will be helpful for everybody in the society, uh, people who are taking decisions and acting on it. And uh, yes, so. You can link it from different, like say you have a Facebook campaign and people want to inquire about it, so those are leads to uh, Google Ads, for example, and uh, walk-in patient examples, appointment for people who are directly taking an appointment. You compare gender, you understand the majority of your patients are males and minorities are females, according to the sample data set we have here. So that's, um, that's the walkthrough of the product. Step one, step two, and step three. Fundamentally, um, that's how we have designed our system to uh, help people using uh, NLP, using data analytics, and using uh, using simple uh, algorithms. And the, and the 
clear and the UI, colorful enough UI so people understand um, how it is that we are um, trying to create customer the decision maker in the end. So any questions so far, feel free to type it out. Um, and um, yeah, okay, moving on. Um, On to some, I'll show you some of the results we've achieved with these technologies. <coughs> okay. So the results uh, are. Oh, I hope it's not Yes. Yeah. Um, we have taken these products to hospitals. From R and D, they have moved on into actual products, and uh, they have responded positively. They like it. For example, many hospitals have a team of live chat agents. They will um, have dedicate a team of around less than 50 people, around 30 people or whatever, to talk to people. Anybody who has a query, they will chat it out, and they will respond. And um, what we have done is um, the idea of ergonomics, human factors, maximum efficiency is let's do let's take this task of responding to people and train it into an agent, an actual language agent. Let the robots speak to the people and get them appointments and, and send them brochures and connect them with the hospital websites through the chatbot button itself. So we as human beings can uh, tackle some of the more important tasks, such as, you know, um, visiting the doctor because you have an appointment dentist appointment today or, you know, uh, attending a VIT webinar. Uh, we take high priority tasks and we do it. <laughs> Uh, much more um, with higher uh, importance then and we take all repetitive tasks and we delegate them to robots or computer algorithms. Another result of how healthcare data analytics is worked out in the field or AI models is some of the models are not just classifying agents or images and um, all that. Uh, they will generate data. For example, some of them you might have already heard robots making their own music and all that. So IBM has generated the AI model that will accelerate drug discovery. You see the picture on the right, uh, taken from their research blog. Um, genetic sequences, uh, they come with the numbers, adenine, guanine, uh, cytosine, and thiamine, um, ATGC, and there are different sequences also. So all these sequences have their own numbers and vectors are attached to it. You can see the numbers. So um, what you do is, you train machines on these uh, vectors and uh, the output value, you need your own data set. And you're able to create new drugs by combining new uh, compatible chemicals or substances. And um, that is how we generate drug discovery for specific problems. So yes, yeah, robots, um, we, we can, it depends on how you want to uh, make your AI uh, work in the real life scenario, use case. And uh, another result is um, we are actually facing a demand to enhance or upgrade manual tasks, such as the live chat system I mentioned about. Um, we want to, they want uh, not only that sometimes appointments, getting appointments with doctors, rescheduling them. All that is there is a demand that we want um, a robot to be able to do these specific tasks. As well. So um, by doing such things, we are able to improve efficiency of patient care. People will feel like um, they're actually, even though you had a bad day at work and you're feeling angry or depressed, um, to be shown reflecting on your emotion in your face. And when you're interacting with customers and patients, they will also feel slightly defensive. But if you're putting a robot uh, who is designed to do a specific task, um, such as getting an appointment immediately within less than a minute with a doctor, you will be able to achieve it. So it's all about efficiency in the end. And... Um, that's why we have done all these systems. So, all the repetitive tasks we delegated to robots, and um, we take care of the important tasks. Um, apart from the results, some of the future work, what we have assigned for our vision in the future of the research is the chatbots, the natural language, the one you just saw speaking in English. How cool would it be if it could speak in Tamil, right? How cool would it be if it could speak in every language in the world? So uh, how are we going to do it? How are we going to get the dictionaries and the vectors? And um, it's 
not too difficult. For example, I don't know, if you have a hackathon project or uh, some project coming up, you should try it. What you can try is the Google Translate API and uh, you get free credits for using it. You just have to create an account. And you can translate Tamil to English and then feed English to our chatbot and um, make sure even how successfully you can make your local uh, well-off people also uh, use the chatbot. So that um, even though it's an English chatbot, you have made it, uh, you scaled it language-wise, and now they are able to use it. Medical data needs to be migrated from legacy systems. Many clinics have legacy systems, legacy databases, and um, old systems, meaning and um, empty values, bogus values. Uh, some of the patients' uh, second name won't be known, uh, middle name, or their ages will not be known, their genders will not be known, their blood test reports will not be known. And you need to check all that for consistency. So that's why we data engineer the machine. So all the data systems, all, for example, all you students in the class will have um, uh, the same similar role numbers and similar university serial numbers and um, the same way. All the, the, all the data needs to be consistent. And the repetitive tasks, uh, that's an algorithm. Basically, that's what an algorithm is. You, if you have some function that needs to be done over and over again, you put the same statement in a function block and you call the function again and again. That's how we do it in computer science. And uh, yes, when you automate it, you'll realize that the number of lines of code reduces and uh, your system will have maximum efficiency as well. And the code will also be more readable. And um, that's it for now from this perspective of healthcare data and analytics, the presentation side. But I would really love to hear some of the questions you have, doubts, or what your ideas and opinions, and um, so I can answer it. Feel free to reach out, uh, please contact us on the email addresses. Uh, I have published two research papers one for epidemic virus disasters, another is a computer vision algorithm for garbage detection. And um, you can get them in Google call. And um, if you reach out, um, if you have anything you want to ask me. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, Arun, this side. So, uh, this is a very uh, famous question, I guess. Uh, I just said that uh, data analysis uh, in conjunction with AI uh, is helpful in predicting the severity of disease or uh, it can give you... So I was just uh, asking that uh, these uh, predictions are never 100% accurate. So a false re result can actually affect the mentality of a patient. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there will be cases where uh, it will give false uh, results. So should we wait for only uh, algorithmic advancements or is there anything that uh, AI has to offer so that uh, uh, these accuracies can be improved uh, to a higher extent? So this is my question. Uh, that's a really good question, Arun. Um, accuracies are uh, important. Uh, nobody is going to trust your system if it is 99.99% accurate. You will only trust it if it is 100% accurate. So how it's a difficult task for us creators to train and machine the robots that will achieve 100% accuracy. It's what you call determinism. Your machine is deterministic if it is giving that output. And uh, no, we should not wait. Nobody likes to wait. Um, there is always something that has not been created yet, which is why all of you will end up inventing something in the future. So feel free to invent your own algorithm, um, your own um, idea of the robot, put a few AI algorithms together, chain them together, and um, see what the output is, and uh, figure out if it is is not overfitting, if you rigorously tested it or break it, if your machine, if you put some noise into your examples, if your machine is still predicting correctly, um, I think you've done well. Did I answer your question, Arun? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh... You're welcome. Good question. Really good question. Any other questions? Uh, guys, you can ask in the chat section also.
there is a form that's been put out. Please feel free to um, take your time to uh, fill it out. And uh, if there's no questions, I'll end with the vote of thanks. I've got a little story for all of you. Sit back, relax, take a sip of water, and uh, I'll read it out for anybody who's having difficulty in reading. So, um, the simple story. A simple thing. Okay. So, one of the most memorable case studies on Japanese management was the case of the empty soap box, which happened in one of Japan's biggest cosmetics companies. The company received a complaint one day that a customer had brought a soap box that was empty. And immediately, the authorities, the QA, and um, everybody they isolated the problem right down to the assembly line, which transported all the soap boxes, the packaged boxes of soap to the delivery department. But for some reason, one soap box somehow went through the assembly line empty. This is the case of the 99.99% uh, efficient model. Management asked its engineers to solve the problem. First case, They were not empty. They worked. No doubt they worked. They worked hard and they worked fast. But they spent a whoop. That's an operation. <coughs> X-rays, ultrasound, people. So, uh, but when a workman was posed with the same problem, uh, he did not get into the complications of X-rays, etc. But uh, he came out with another solution. For a simple one. All he did he bought out a strong industrial electric fan and he pointed it at the assembly line. Switched the fan on and as each soap box passed the fan, simply blew the empty boxes out of the line. Thank you. So, uh, so, uh, hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I would Hi. like to thank uh, thank all the participants who supported us throughout the session, and we hope the event was a great addition to your knowledge. I would also like to express my heartfelt gratitude to our event speak event coordinators and the board members. Without which, this event wouldn't have been possible. Most importantly, a, a huge thanks to our speaker who shared such a valuable knowledge, knowledge with us today. It was definitely a wonderful and a very informative session, sir. Thank you again. Thank you, Megna. Appreciate it. I. You were a really good audience too, very interactive, good questions, uh, and um, thank you for the support. If there's anything else you'd like to like me to teach or understand or uh, want to reach out to us for projects, please feel free to do so. And thank you, Sonia, as well. You did love setting it up. This is a great session from your side too. There is a club LinkedIn page and uh, related information shared. You can check it out. No it is quest. Um, appreciate the support, everybody. Yes, there is a <coughs> yes, yes. please. There is a attendance form posted in the chat box. Please do fill that before you leave. Yeah, do that. And also, uh, make sure you attend all the other webinars too. Our rap album coming out soon called Earth Five called Revidian. Check out my previous music called South Indies. South Indian music. Enjoy. I'll be taking off from here. Uh, please feel free to reach out if you need anything uh, more from my side. I'll be available anytime to do this. Thank you. Have a nice day.
Thank you so much sir. Thank you sir. Thank you so much sir. Thank you so much sir. Have a good day.